unmute myself. Welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. I hope you all enjoyed the snowfall on Thursday night as much as I did. Much needed moisture. I know of the following prayer concerns in our community. We continue to pray for the Naranjo family and for Ray. We also offer up prayers for Dwight and for Gabe and Mimi. Are there any other prayer requests today, either here in the sanctuary or if you're watching on Zoom, you can pop them in the chat box and I'll hear them from my amazing tech wizard over in the corner. Yeah. First for Prayers for Jackie's brother Bill and hospice. Yeah, Kathleen? Oh, goodness. Sawyer? Prayers for Sawyer, the three-year-old daughter of Kathleen's friends. Friend, you're the three-year-old niece of one of Kathleen's friends who was in the hospital in Denver with cancer and things are not looking good. Prayers? for her and for her whole family. Yep. Prayers for the family of Rick Lohman, a music educator in Santa Fe who died yesterday. These and many others we lift up to God. A few announcements. We are shy on liturgists for February, by which I mean I think we have one. So if you would like to read scripture and worship, we would love to have you always. Please see me or Carrie after worship and we will get you signed up. If you would like to read in March or April or May or June, you are equally welcome to let us know about it. See also greeters, <laughs> though we only have one Sunday missing in February. Carrie, do you recall the date? The 20th of February. If you would like to be a greeter on the 20th of February, we would love to have you see either of us after worship. We all, Consuelo? Okay, a key was left last Sunday. If you are missing a key, please see Consuelo. Or here in the back of the sanctuary. Great. Um, we also begin on uh, this Wednesday, February 2nd at 10 a.m., a Bible study on Ruth. It will last the month of February. Handily, Ruth is four chapters, and the month of February is four weeks. It will work out perfectly. I encourage all of you to attend. We will meet via Zoom, and this will then, in when we hit Lent, our Lenten Wednesday will be an evening activity. At this, let's see, noisy coin toss. That's the next thing on my list. <laughs> I have terrible handwriting on Sunday mornings. Uh, we begin again our noisy coin toss today. After worship, you are invited to toss in coins because they make a lot of noise, but dollar bills work real well as well. Um, we will be reinstating this practice, which has been a long-standing tradition in this congregation. It will take place on the final Sunday of the month. Sometimes that's the fourth. Sometimes it's the fifth. I encourage all of you to give generously. This, go, uh, Jenny, remind me where this goes. Thank you. This goes to the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Santa Fe. And Jenny, would you like to come forward? She has a wonderful announcement for us. Good morning. We were notified this week by the Lutheran Family Services then we have our Afghan family coming. Um, after waiting for a couple of months, uh, we now have a family of eight, uh, two parents in their 30s and six children between the ages of eight months and 13. 
and five of the six children are girls. So we are very excited about that, especially girls, because girls don't have much of a chance in Afghanistan today under the Taliban. So uh, they are currently here in Santa Fe. Uh, they're in an Airbnb temporarily um, as the L LFS folks find a permanent home for them. So all of the things that we have collected, including uh, what's in half of Koinonia Hall, we're gonna have to wait until they get that house before we're able to donate those. But uh, great news for us, and we're just so, so excited to have a large family with lots of kids that we can help. Thanks. I want to take a moment and thank Jenny and Diane Magaha, who's not here this morning, for taking point on this project. They are our joint team leads. They have raised over $6,000 to support this family and basically enough furniture and housewares to outfit this family, though I don't know that we were expecting eight people. We may need to find a few more bed frames. And today, we also have a birthday. And so the musicians have, would like to offer a birthday song. And I can see him slightly rolling his eyes at me. <laughs> to our very own Jim Rocare. <laughs> we are called to care for the most vulnerable among us and you all have done so and continue to do so and this whole congregation is grateful to one another because we have been very lucky in this pandemic let us hope and pray that that luck continues to hold out the omicron variant is highly contagious we all know this we're seeing still seeing cases rise here in new mexico Please continue to wear masks that cover your nose and mouth as long as you are not leaving worship. Wash your hands thoroughly. Proof of full vaccination as determined by the CDC currently, that is both vaccine shots and two weeks past the second is required for worship attendance. It is our hope that this will allow us to safely expand our worship activities, perhaps when numbers have dipped a little bit. We do keep a running list of all those whose vaccine cards or other proof of vaccination we have seen so that if you have come to church with it once and then have forgotten it, we have a record that we have seen it. But we do require it because this is a commitment that we have made as a community that we will all be vaccinated. And so if you have not yet shown your vaccine card or if you would like to invite a friend or relative, please do know that as much as we hate to do it, we will be turning away anyone who does not have a vaccination card, unlike a mask, which we can produce out of the box in the back. We cannot produce proof of vaccination. If you don't like to carry it with you, as I know some don't, you are welcome to send the church office an image or a scan of your proof of vaccination and we will put you down on our list. And now I invite you to rise for our call to worship. Thank you, God, for gathering us. Remind us again of your love. The good news of the gospel is this, the God of all creation came to dwell among us. But we crucified this revelation of sacrificial love. God went to the depths to gather us all. In Christ's resurrection, we are drawn again to the presence of God. This is good news for all who hear. Please be seated.
The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Let us together confess our sin using the words printed in your bulletin. Merciful and loving God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling to proclaim the good news in word and deed. We are quick to speak when we ought to listen and remain silent when it is time to speak. We put too much faith in our own actions and fail to trust the spirit. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways. Strengthen us anew to follow Christ's way in the world. By your Holy Spirit, Give us the grace we need to be your faithful disciples and fulfill our common calling through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Beloved, lift your heads and your hearts and know this. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God of all the prophets, you knew us and chose us before you formed us in the womb. Fill us with faith that speaks your word, hope that does not disappoint, and love that bears all things for your sake. Until that day when we shall know you fully, even as we are known by you. Amen. Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, That was you will quote to me this proverb, Dr. Sure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there are many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove them out of town, and led them to the brow of the hill from which their town was built, so that they might hurl them off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. La lectura bíblica se encuentra en San Lucas. Capitulo 4, versículos 21 a 30. Él comenzó a hablar, diciendo, Hoy mismo se ha cumplido la escritura que se desataban de leer. Todos hablaban bien de Jesús. Estaban admirados de, de las cosas tan bellas que decía. Se preguntaban. ¿No es este el hijo de José? Jesús les respondió. Seguramente ustedes me dirán este refrán. Médico, trate a ti mismo. Y además me dirán, lo que oímos que hiciste en Capernaum, hazlo también aquí en tu propia tierra. Y siguió, y siguió, y siguió. Oh, diciendo, les aseguro que ningún profeta es bien recibido, recibido en su propia tierra. Pero realmente había muchas viudas en Israel en tiempos del profeta Elías, cuando no llovió durante tres años y medio, 
y hubo mucho hambre en todo el país. Pero Elias no fue enviado a ninguna de las viudas israelitas, sino a uno de Sarapta, cerca de la ciudad de Sidón. También había en Israel muchos enfermos de lepra en tiempo que el profeta Eliseo, pero no fue sanado ninguno de ellos, sino Namán, que era de Siria. Al oír esto, todos los que estaban en la sinagoga de Anahón mucho, se levantaron y escucharon del pueblo a Jesús, llevándolo a lo alto del monte sobre el cual el pueblo estaba construido, para arrojarlo abajo desde ahí. Pero Jesús pasó por en medio de ellos y se fue. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O God, who is rock and redeemer. Amen. Sometimes when I read gospel stories, I imagine that living alongside Jesus might have been very frustrating. There are a number, any number of stories about him that make me roll my eyes a little bit. He likes to poke and prod at people, maybe even to goad them. He seems to reach into people's minds and say what they're thinking perhaps sometimes even preemptively. And I know from personal experience, not with Jesus, but you know, with my parents, that's very frustrating. We all really hate being, I told you so, and we really, really hate hearing it before we've even done the thing. We like to have the privacy of our own heads where we can be as petty or as rude as we like or as doubting. Jesus, though, in, my, in terms my friends and I might use, he says the inside thoughts outside, or more properly, he says his community's inside thoughts outside, says them before they can speak them, maybe even before those thoughts are fully formed. He sees them coming down the pipe through those neurons and he addresses them, which honestly is probably pretty frustrating if you live next door to Jesus as the person who hasn't consciously had the thought just yet. And this particular passage of, of scripture is made the more confusing because it drops us in the middle of a narrative with no context whatsoever. So let me give you some context. Jesus has just been baptized in the Jordan. The spirit of God has descended upon him and called him and claimed him. He's returned to Galilee and has been preaching at the synagogues in the region. People are impressed. He was praised by everyone, Luke writes. And then he arrives in Nazareth where he had been brought up. And he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. And here I quote from Luke, he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, have he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. That's 
the verse before our reading from today begins. So we begin our story today with Jesus, who's just finished reading from Isaiah. He's got a hometown crowd in front of him. News has been spreading throughout the region about how great he is. This is a crowd of people who want to like him. They want to be proud of him. They want to claim him as one of their own. And Jesus, he gives what is arguably his shortest sermon ever, presuming Luke is indeed recording it in full. Today, he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then he stops talking. But the people of Nazareth don't. The synagogue fills with words. They talk about him, his words. They praise him. They imagine that surely this hometown boy will save them, will rescue them, will favor them. Do you ever wonder if the disciples began to be able to pinpoint the turning point at which they were about to be run out of town? Because Jesus rejects their praise, rejects the idea that he will favor Nazareth or Galilee or Israel over any other. And that's a hard thing for the community that helped raise him to hear. It's a hard thing for any of us to hear this reminder that Jesus serves not just us, but all, even and especially including those left out or left behind. To remember that Jesus came to be the light of the world, not just for us, but for everyone. And thinking about Jesus's ministry, about God's power, about the movement of the Holy Spirit, I always come back to C.S. Lewis. And not any of his theology books, though they are good, solid, helpful theology, and I recommend them all to you if you want to sit down with some really solid theology that is digestible. But no, what I think about when I think about C.S. Lewis is that wonderful and strange children's series about a land called Narnia. You've heard me reference this particular passage before, and I'm sure you will hear me reference it again. One of the Pevensey children asks the beavers if Aslan, the lion, is safe. He's not a tame lion, they reply. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. C.S. Lewis was a brilliant theologian, and so his analogy has stood the test of time. There are many theologians and many analogies about God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, but it is this one, this one from a children's novel I first read in the tail end of second grade, and that I come back to over and over again. Because what's brilliant about these books, about this passage, is that though the Pevensey children come back safe at the end of each adventure, they don't come back unchanged. And they also don't ever return home without the sure knowledge that following Aslan is dangerous, can be deadly, because Aslan isn't safe but he is good. Too many books about faith, not just books for children, but books for adults who maybe ought to know better, present faith as sort of a machine. Put one trust in God here, get something else out over here. They don't mention that faith can be dangerous, or if they do, they don't take that danger seriously. They don't mention that it can be joyful. Lewis describes Lucy's reaction to hearing about Aslan as the feeling in your stomach on the first day of the summer holidays. 
Too many books present God as tamed to our human desires. God doesn't work like that. We claim Jesus Christ as Lord and strive to walk in his way. We do this with the promise and assurance that we are loved and forgiven, that God accompanies us no matter where we go. And none of that promises that we will be safe. None of that suggests a reward. We may turn to the Sermon on the Mount or any of Jesus's other teachings, but everywhere we lurk, we are called to serve the vulnerable and the oppressed because Christ did, because we have a servant Lord, not because there is some sort of prize at the end of the day that we win by doing enough good deeds, by putting enough tokens into this machine of faith. Because after all, Jesus's life shows us that not even being the son of God could save one from suffering. Even Aslan is sacrificed. God doesn't play favorites. I believe, like many others, that God has a preferential option for the poor. And by poor, I mean those who are kept out and kept down. But a preferential option, however much it may sound, it does not mean favorites. It means that God sees them, hears them, responds to them, and calls us to do so as well. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus read, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is doing some scriptural paraphrasing here. You won't find those words all run together like that in Isaiah. And what Jesus leaves out of this prophecy is as noticeable as who he includes. Because Jesus leaves out references to Israel. Now in Christian biblical interpretation, this has long been interpreted as supersession. This idea that Jesus' followers and the Christian church take over the Jewish religion and their chosen status. Luke is not the most Jewish friendly of the Gospels. He writes often about the Jews as though they are some sort of monolith and not a people and religion spread far and wide across the Roman Empire and beyond. He writes about them this way because of tensions between the early Christians who still considered themselves at least mostly Jewish and Jewish religious authorities who both contested their claim of Messiah and were concerned, probably rightly, about the political ramifications of this new sect. And so the gospels, and this is one of those complicated things, about being Christian, the Gospels, in addition to being the word of God, are often quite polemical and political and partisan. And we, the church, drank all that up. Centuries of biblical interpretation and prejudice. All of it to be able to say that we are the chosen ones. God will attend to us first and the rest of the world second. And because we knew in our heart of hearts that that wasn't quite the right interpretation, the church aided and abetted and instigated pogroms and ghettos and repression and inquisitions and tortures. And it landed us in a place where the church could and did turn a blind eye to the ravages of the Shah, at least six million Jewish people dead, 
alongside others the church considered unimportant, communists, ethnic minorities, the LGBTQ community, and far too many others. Our desire to be special in God's eyes, to be the only one seen, or at the very least the first, has had a devastating effect on so many people and on the Jewish community in particular. We need only look at the Colleyville hostage situation to know that the effects of this particular sin and misinterpretation are long reaching and long lasting. And I know all of you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. That is not who we are called to be. God loves the whole of creation, doesn't pick favorites. God sent Jesus to serve all, not just the community of Nazareth or the Jewish people or the Christian church, all people, all creation even. Jesus's reinterpretation of Isaiah isn't about supplanting the Jewish people. It isn't about excluding them from what is coming. His rebuke to Nazareth isn't about that either. It's a reminder that God's welcome is wide and for all. There is room in God's house because this is God's world, not ours. We belong to God. God calls each and every one of us by name, knows us, formed us, but God does not belong to us because after all, God isn't tame. And who said anything about safe? Because of course God isn't safe, but God is good all the time. All the time, all the time. We just have to open our doors and our hearts a little wider, catch a glimpse of that wide welcome and trust that there is room for us, no matter how many God calls, there is always room for more. Thanks be to God. Amen.
They are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works for each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished to each man and the gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word, and the celebration of the sacraments. Like to invite oh, and our ruling elders to be supported and installed, representing the one holy Catholic installed church, the session of Westminster Presbyterian Church, and our ordained Taylor Walker to ministry of the ruling elder. And installs her into active service in this congregation. The session also installs to active service those who have previously been, been ordained, and today this is Deacon Brad Twig. Brian and Priscilla, I invite you to come forward. Standing there is great and turn and face the people who have elected you. This part is for everyone to answer, and I will prompt you when you desire a response. As God calls some to particular forms of ministry, God calls us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptism practice, renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule, and affirming the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn away from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his gracious love? If so, we say, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, we say, I will, with God's help. I certainly hope that I got this part actually in the bulletin because it would be very long to come to your responses. Do you have the confession of faith? With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son of our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified and died and was delivered. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God and the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and 
eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. We praise you for leading your people Israel through the waters of the sea, out of bondage and into freedom in the land of your gods. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan, who was anointed as the Christ by the Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you for pouring out your Holy Spirit, who teaches us and leads us into all truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations and serve you as a royal priesthood. We rejoice that you have claimed us in our baptism and anointing us for service in Christ's name, and that by your grace we are born again. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. Brad and Consuelo. In baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the constitution of the Presbyterian Church, as I say, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the Church Universal, and God's word to you? If so, please say, I do. Do you sincerely adopt and receive the essential tenets of Reformed faith? as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you be the people of God? If so, please say, I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's colleague, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the order of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say, I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, please say I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, please say I will. And for our deacon, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urgent concern? And directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. For our ruling elder. Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline? Serving in councils of the church and in your ministry, we try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ. If so, please say, I will. And now for the congregation, you have your own set of questions. 
Did we, the members of the church, accept Brad and Consuelo as new elders and deacons? Tell them, my God, through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. If so, we say we do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, we say we do. As I said, when we did this early, earlier this month, this would normally be the time where I would call forward all those who have been ordained by the Presbyterian Church USA to come forward and lay their hands on the soil as our newly ordained newly elder. Somewhat obviously with COVID, but it's not a big plan. So I invite you instead, and I know it's a long prayer. To lift up your hand in blessing that we might direct it toward the soil and toward grass. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Throughout the ages and in every place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point to the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear placing their trust in evil alone, for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth, for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, we proclaim your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all who said and did. Pour out your spirit upon your servant, whom you called by baptism as your own. Grant to her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. We also give you thanks for your servant, Brad, as he continues in the ministry to which you have called him. Help him to rely on the gifts of your spirit and to follow Christ faithfully in his calling. Give him a spirit of truthfulness that he may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly governing people. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church and ministry. Ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be effective servants of the gospel. Offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Brad and Consuelo, you are now deacon and ruling elder, ordained to the ministry of service and governance of the Church of Jesus Christ, and for this particular congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the risen and crucified Christ. Crucified and risen Christ is a better word. Amen. Now, after the charge to both of you in your service to Westminster, as elder and deacon, and in your service outside of these doors, to your fiance in Mexico, as God can and you, as you do. First Peter. Chapter 4, verses 7 to 11 say, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you. Whoever speaks must do so by not speaking to the 
very word of God. For the servants must do so with the strength of God's God, so that God may be glorified in all things in Jesus Christ. We can belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. At this time, I invite like the congregation to welcome these two to service with an among us. <laughs> Friends, invite you to yourselves so that through your gifts, others here and elsewhere. <laughs> They experience the fullness of God's grace in the world of Jesus. If you walk through a line, they might be gathered and offering and preparing and going to the church, or a check for scheduling it in a little drop it in a post box. For those who are in the sanctuary, you're invited to drop your offering in the plate of the community in voice in this space. And also, we have a bowl for the noisy coin toss. So, if you haven't done so already, you can leave your offering for the noisy coin toss also. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for everyone who helps us discover and grow as followers of Jesus. Whatever form our offerings take, may our gifts help to reveal Jesus to the world. Amen. Let us bring the needs of the church, the world, and all needs to God's loving care. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide so that united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table and serve you in one common ministry. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the rulers of nations. Move them to set aside their fear, greed, and vain ambition, and bow to your sovereign rule. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us who consume most of the earth's resources the will to reorder our lives, that all may have their rightful share of the food, medical care, and shelter, and so have the necessities of a life of dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Restore among us a love of the earth you created for our home. Help us put an end to ravishing its land, air, and waters, and give us respect for all your creatures, that living in harmony with everything you have made, your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress. Free us from violence. Guard us from the perils of materialism. Give all a new vision of a life of harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen this congregation. Sorry, there's a cat. <laughs> Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love that our voice... <clears throat> that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your son. 
Nourish us with your word and sacraments that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases, those in prison, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. As you have moved toward us in love, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now with the confidence of the beloved children of God, with the confidence of a cat stalking into worship on Sunday morning. Let us join our voices in the prayer Christ taught us using the words closest to your heart or those printed in the bulletin. Padre nuestro, que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga tu reino. Hágase tu voluntad, como en el cielo, así también en la tierra. El pan nuestro de cada día, danoslo hoy. Y perdonanos nuestras deudas, como también perdonamos a nuestros deudores. Y no nos deje caer en tentación, mas líbranos del mal, porque tuyo es el reino, el poder y la gloria por todos los siglos. Amén. Go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you and those whom God loves this whole world over. Amen. <laughs>